Yes. Hello, and welcome to the third of our table talks, this time focusing on new approaches to romantic studies and youth. Um, along the, the bottom of your screen um, with Zoom webinar, uh, you have a couple of options, for example, to raise hand, but also to ask questions in um, the Q&A. And I'll just make it so that everyone can see um, all the things on the questions. Um, you, people have been saying hi in the chat, and um, which is all um, very nice. We haven't even started to talk about the weather and where people are, um, but you can do that in the chat. But if you have questions that you particularly want to ask of us or ask of one person in particular, if you put that in the question and answers, it kind of organises things um, a little bit more. But what's going to happen today is I'm going to do a little introduction. Uh, I should have checked that to see that my screen worked. Well, hopefully it will. Ah, um, here we go. Everyone can see that, can't they? There's some nodding. It's all good. Um, and then um, I'll do a little introduction. I'll do a lightning table talk of my own. And then we have six um, lightning table talks lined up for you. Firstly, from my postdoctoral research fellow in the Romantic Ridiculous, um, Rita. Uh, and then um, from um, the rest of the people that you can see on your screen, who I will sort of introduce um, briefly. Um, as we sort of go through the evening um, and it's going to be uh, hopefully a lovely and festive and convivial event thinking about um, youth in lots of different ways um, in the in the romantic period but also from the romantic period into a kind of wider sense of romantic studies so sort of an, a, a brief introduction to sort of reiterate if people have been to table talks before but also to sort of introduce it to those with, uh, to whom it's a little bit um, unfamiliar. It's part of an AHRC funded project. I think I'm contractually obliged to say that it's funded by the AHRC in all of these events um, called The Romantic Ridiculous that Rita and I are working on. Um, this workshop is being recorded. I probably should have had, had the screen up uh, earlier on. Um, please tweet us using hashtag table talks if you wish to sort of broadcast your participation in the event. Say hello in the chat and ask questions using Q&A and my Twitter handle is at Dr Beard. 79 and here we have i was i was thinking about talking about clueless um but i've just used um sharing clueless um the best adaptation of emma ever as a sort of um spur for others to think about uh, what they want to talk about in the uh, in their lightning table talks um so a brief idea about what table talks uh, are about um, they were designed as progress markers for the romantic ridiculous and i'm going to talk a little bit about the progress that we've made um, together over the past um, six months since the last table talk. Uh, but they're also opportunities to share work in progress, sort of new ideas about sort of readings that we are working on collectively. Um, and I pitched it to the AHRC as an example of co-duction, uh, which is an idea from Wayne Booth, but also Maureen McLean, um, who thought about it as meaning leading through conversation and close um, reading and um, the AHRC funding that I got was an AHRC leadership fellowship. So this was my idea of, of how to lead, which is sort of by sort of hosting talks and encouraging others to share their research. Uh, and what I'm really keen on with table, table Talks is that they are celebrations of the work of early career scholarship. So everyone gets paid um, a little bursary uh, to come and talk to us, um, which I think is really Sort of useful and enriching and as the title suggests they're focused on new approaches to romantic studies so they're, 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 they're looking at new ways of thinking about um, the romantic period and they're also um, designed to lead up to the bars nasa conference that's happening next summer which is on new romanticism so there's a sort of um, rationale for the for the build-up of these table talks as to be part of the, a bigger romantic studies conversation um, so these, I, I just shared a few images um, uh, to, to sort of remind me what I wanted to talk about in, in relation to the progress of the Romantic Ridiculous uh, work. The first image is um, a picture of Windermere Jetty, a museum that I'm working with 
on a, an exhibition that I've called Ridiculous Romantics in an in a attempt to steal um, Horrible History's funder and, and use it for literary criticism. And I'm working with a, a local school on an exhibition about sublime and ridiculous ways of thinking about landscape. And I thought that was a, an example of a, a, a sublime landscape that I took uh, when I went on a field trip up there with a um, school. And over the last um, term since October, uh, Rita and I have been working on the impact activities associated with the Romantic Ridiculous. Uh, um, we've been working with schools and running sort of field trips and workshops to encourage students to think of new ways to consider um, the romantic poetry that they that they've been looking at in in class in sort of location in the Lake District and then also through this strange prism uh, of the ridiculous and I'm, I'm quite excited by what the students at this particular school going to Windermere Jetty uh, have been up to they've thought about um, things like sub subverting the sublime which was like looking through a telescope that you expect is going to be through it to a sublime landscape and it has a sort of ridiculous kaleidoscope kaleidoscopic image in it possibly involving mermaids at the last um at the last version of the workshop they did with the schools uh, and they're also thinking about um sort of a sound installation about um, Kubla Khan moving from chaos to order, which I thought was really an a really interesting response to Kubla Khan, actually. Um, and then the, the, the middle image is just me boasting, because off the back of um, the Romantic Ridiculous project, I got invited to do a keynote at the University of York, um, an, art, sort of an art history conference on, um, uh, it was about questioning periodicity, and I did a presentation about the sort of ridiculous ways of thinking about romanticism, especially related to a, a, a film that was out, put out in 2020 uh, called The Trouble with Nature, and sort of thinking about how that film represented romantic struggles with um, mastery over nature or our lack of ability to master nature and what that means uh, and how that sort of works as a kind of romantic legacy all the way through to the 21st century. And then I sort of I, I've got an image of um, Emma, which is I, I I wanted to sort of be accountable to sort of failures that have happened, and then I realised that I've uh, in in kind of self defence I, I used an image from from Emma, which is an example of sort of both success and failure in lots of ways. In that Rita and I collaborated with others on a roundtable about the film Emma, um, but we also tried to um, work get a um, res we responded very enthusiastically to a call for papers, and then our um, our abstract was was mysteriously lost for months and months, and then we're sort of trying to work out uh, a way to sort of um, a, a new venue to sort of publish this uh, piece of work. But I also had at the same time I had difficulties in placing another piece of work that I'd done, and I wanted to sort of say that um, just as the Romantic Ridiculous Project thinks about failure as part of ridiculousness that sort of inspires new ways of thinking about things sort of we've experienced our own sort of share of failure this year in in placing um our sort of strange and wacky work in um academic publications and that has led to us thinking about sort of where these things can go and 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 what to do with them and i thought it would be it, it's nice to sort of um it's nice to be honest and share progress uh, which is exciting like impact and keynotes but also progress which sort of might be stalled at the moment but which is hopefully going to lead to excitingly different avenues than we were expecting where um academics or journal editors have been less keen than they sounded like they were going to be um about our work and i thought the the image of i can't remember the actress who played emma's name but it's gone it's gone out of my head but that image of her having a nosebleed made me think about sort of failure and bodily failure and um her her own her her own self is ridiculous, which is all part of the um, essay that we are working on at the moment. Anyway, so we um, this the the next sort of remainder of this first hour is going to be spent um, doing lightning table talks, um, and I've found this lightning table online and have used it as my image part partially because I covet it. Um, for my own home, possibly more for the the big kettle and the not kettle teapot and and um, cups and saucers, but also the table itself. Um, I would like, but the lightning table talks are brief um, engagements with our research that are to sort of show what we've been doing, but also to spark conversation um, later and. Um, just to give you more of a sense of our schedule, I'm going to be thinking about Sarah Coleridge's Phantasmian, 
Um, and I blogged about it in a blog called London Baby, but I also went to London, which I think I guess is also part of my progress that for the first time during the pandemic in the summer, I went down to London and spent the week in the British Library, which was a sort of an exciting and thrilling prospect, including looking at Sarah Coleridge's work, but also looking at Samuel Taylor Coleridge's notebooks. I had to have kind of like a signed letter from my place of work that I was a kosher academic and able to go. I wasn't allowed to take pictures of it or anything, and it was very exciting. And then Rita is going to be um, looking at Elizabeth Uhlberg's um, recent rewrite of Pride and Prejudice, which is called Prom and Prejudice. And then we're going to have Val thinking about the editorial process in preparing an edition of Elizabeth Gunning's um, The Foresters. And I think that's a, a really exciting new thing that we're doing in this table talk is thinking about sort of editing and publishing as a as a thing that we can think about and um, talk about. So I'm really excited uh, for that presentation. Tim is going to be talking about the sort of conduct book literature and, and sort of writing for teens, which I'm really interested in, of the Ongar Taylors. Um, Anna will talk about education through ridiculousness in, in Susan Ferrier's wonderful novel, Marriage. Um, Hannah is going to be talking about periodical satire on female accomplishments. And Rosie is going to look at, I, I'm going to use her title because I think it's brilliant, John Keats' Silliest Letter, which I think is going to be a thrilling end to the um, session. So that's that's the, the, the lineup for tonight. Uh, and we're going to get me out of the way. Um, first and, and then sort of give it over to the, the, the early career researchers who are going to share their really exciting and interesting um, work. Um, the thing that I'm going to talk about is um, Phantasmian's tremulous laugh. And I was, I was, I, I noted this down in some detail in, um, in my, during my British Library visit, but this is also partially inspired by Matt Ward's seminar paper that he delivered for EHU 19, our research centre, which was on, um, Keats's melodious chuckle and, and his work on laughter has made me think about um, what Sarah Coleridge is doing with um, laughter in uh, in her novel. So Phantasmian, if you don't know it, you should. It's this sort of weird and wonderful, possibly ridiculous um, fairy tale where the hero um, Phantasmian is um, sort of um, enchanted by um, the fairy Potentilla, who you'll see in this sort of quotation is talking to him, um, into a variety of insect forms. So he's like, he's a butterfly at one point. He's also, a, he becomes a fly, a cricket, an ant warrior, and then the, a, a, I think a spider, and then a, a sort of weird, so I don't think it's supposed to be a dung beetle, but I thought of it as a dung beetle at the end where he's kind of trapped in the earth and is, is this sort of huge, slow, um, lugubrious thing. And he has a, he he's on a very complicated quest to deal with a lot of adult love triangles that I sort of tried to note down and map out but even I, it, it, it generally escaped me sort of how everyone related to each other it's, it's kind of an incestuous um, thing um, but I was really interested in the early um, representation of Phas Phantasmian as a child and I'm really interested in Sarah Coleridge's representations of um, childhood um, here. So on this page, um, this is from the, the, the longer quotation that I, I put in the readings, um, but I thought this was really interesting where Pontentilla is saying um, that as a child you didn't, you don't, you, thou needest no fairy now to work wonders for thee, being yet so young that all thou beholdest is new and marvellous um, in, in, in thine eyes. So there's, there's a sense that children don't need, don't need fairy tales, it's sort of older people who, who, who need to have wonder given back to them, uh, but happiness will fade away. Um, and if you call on the name of Potentilla, uh, I will exert all my power to renew the delights and wonders of thy childhood. So it's a really interesting representation of a, a child's sort of position towards wonder that the that, that Phantasmian as a child doesn't need um, a fairy to help him see things as marvellous but when his happiness fades away he will need to call on Potatilla for this sort of re a re-enchantment is is how that um, should go. Uh, but then in the next chapter on and this is really early on in the text he finds out Phantasmian finds out that his mother is dead, but he sort of doesn't believe it at the beginning. And so the, the bit that I've put in red is a tremulous laugh, but he says, um, how darest thou say that my mother is dead? He, he says in a haughty tone, tone to this gardener who tells him that, that he breaks the bad news to him. Go to her chamber and see, replied the man sternly. And how can I see her if she is dead, rejoined the boy with a tremulous laugh. Can I see the cloud of yesterday in yon clear sky? Like clouds, the dead vanish away and we see them no more. And again, I think it's a really interesting way of thinking about how children think about death, that, that death is like clouds vanishing 
so you you don't see um you don't see the dead that nothing uh, is left of them but the tremulous laugh shows that kind of uncertainty in the child's sort of position in in relation to the um adult so i've been thinking about all, all the different ways that the 18th century and 19th century thought about laughter so there's a sort of superiority theory theory that we we laugh when we're um uh, when we feel ourselves above what we're being laughed at and there's a sort of sense that the prince is kind of laughing at the gardener but sort of coleridge is um undercutting that superiority theory with its tremulousness that that Phantasmian is rightly uncertain about whether he is superior um, in this instance. And then there's an, a competing incongruity theory which said that we laugh at what is sort of unexpected and what sort of um, makes us see that kind of disjunction between what we expect and what actually happens. And I think that you've, you've got that sort of incongruousness here, but it's sort of a very dark incongruousness about a mother's, um, a mother's dying. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And then I thought that um, laughter had this really sort of surprisingly dark position um, in the fairy tale. So it tends to be the evil characters um, who laugh and laughter gets, I think, connected with evil over the course of um, the, um, the, the fairy tale. So Sashelma is a, this sort of the, a fishy antagonist. And um, at her first appearance, she sort of threatens people and then makes no reply, save the murmuring sound of laughter, which I was, uh, which caught my interest. Uh, and then sort of all the way through the text, there's a sort of sense of um, laughter being this malevolent um, force in the text. So even in the natural world, um, when one of the main characters is trapped in a, in a maze and can't seem to get out, it seemed as if the water mocked her distress, babbling while she wept bitterly and crying, fair one, follow me, see how I leap down the um, precipice. And the, 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 scent, the, the waterfall is kind of is mocking her, but also leading her towards like uh, what might be potentially suicide. So another sort of dark kind of laughter. And then Sashelma, the sort of evil fish woman, uh, again, is described by one of the, um, the, the figures in the text called Pence. Slime, pencil mayor. I'm not very good with names. Uh, there stood before me a strange form, half fish, half woman. Then with a burst of merriment, she plunged amid the waves, which swallowed her with the gurgling sounds of laughter. So again, that sort of, um, I love the way that, that, that laughter is described, murmuring, babbling, um, gurgling. But the, these are sort of given kind of antagonistic um, force in the text. Uh, and then sort of kind of sort of in the last example we, we have sort of evil kind of defeating itself so Meldala, Meldaril, who's a kind of evil prophetess her form half hidden by the wreaths of smoke from the center in her hand stood laughing at the entrance of the cave till at last she fell upon the ground overpowered by the fumes she had heedlessly inhaled so kind of laughter uh, laughter sort of gets her into um more trouble than um it's worth and, and ends with her um, unconscious, and I thought that was a, a, an interesting sort of circularity to the, the to the laughter there, sort of in its own way, kind of tremulous. Anyway, these are my th these are very much my work in progress thoughts about um, phantasmian and laughter, and the sort of the the dark place of laughter in um, this fairy tale, where it, it seems to sort of um, show sort of uncertainty, but also kind of malevolence in the um, in the laughter. That is my bit. And I, what I forgot to do, oh, thank you. What I forgot to do is put the um, the, the thing that I copied and pasted, um, which is the the Google Drive, which has links to all of these things uh, for people to um, um, keep track of. Anya Taylor-Joy, that was the name that I'd forgotten. Unfortunately, I couldn't see the chat while I was talking. And thank you, Molly. Um, it is a glorious novel. More people should read um, Phantasmian. So that was my bit. Um, I was just sort of catching up with the chat and putting the Google Drive in. So you can, through the Google Drive, you should be able to get all of the talks and PowerPoints that are um, available. And I've tried to sort of name them um, with sort of first name first, if possible. Um, but the next person to speak is Rita, who's, who's that way for me. Hi, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Excellent. So I'll start sharing my screen. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yeah. You're good to go. Okay. So it seems really appropriate that I would be talking about Jane Austen on her birthday. Um, so here's the mandatory um, Jane Austen content. 
Uh, so I'll be talking just for a little bit about Elizabeth Ulberg's Prom and Prejudice, which as I'm sure you can tell from the title is a young adult reimagining of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. So this is very new research for me. It's something that I'm very excited about, but only just starting. So um, I have some, some thoughts that I'd like to share with you. Uh, so I'm really interested in how Austen's novels can be made to be of relevance to the lives of young people today. And Austen's novels are deeply rooted in a very particular social and political context. But what I have been finding as I read popular culture reimaginings of her novels is that her portrayals of gender and class still very much resonate with young people today. And Austen's novels in similarity to young adult novels are concerned with the passage from childhood into adulthood and the challenges that young people face at this time in their lives. By taking inspiration from Austen's engagement uh, with questions regarding gender and class, Prom and Prejudice is a great example of how young adult novels are continuing these conversations by transferring them into present day contexts, in this case, a modern American high school. In the original uh, Austen novel, Pride and Prejudice, Elizabeth Bennet is precariously positioned in society as a genteel woman with no fortune. She is the daughter of a gentleman on one hand, but will only receive the very meager amount of 50 pounds a year after his death. And this is only after her mother has also passed away. In Prom and Prejudice, Ulberg finds for her heroine, Lizzie, a somewhat modern equivalent of Elizabeth's peripheral position by making her a scholarship student at the prestigious Longbourn Academy. Class is at the center of the novel from its very first page, where Ulberg writes that Longbourn's prom is reported in national fashion magazines and that Longbourn girls don't go to the mall to get their dresses, no, they boast couture from designers whose names adorn their speed dial. And it's in this context that Lizzie meets the snobby Will Darcy. And the scene I've chosen for us to look at today is the equivalent in Prom and Prejudice to the one in Pride and Prejudice where Elizabeth visits Darcy's estate, Pemberley. So I love that image. That's an illustration from the Folio Society edition of Pride and Prejudice. So in the original scene, um, Elizabeth is establishing an effective relationship of ownership towards Darcy's estate by imagining herself inhabiting it as its mistress. As Elizabeth familiarizes herself with every part of Pemberley, she begins to imagine the kind of life she could have there as well as the considerable influence and responsibility that would come with the position of wife of the owner of such a large estate. During the tour of the estate, Elizabeth also finds out things she didn't know before about Darcy, that he is a kind and conscientious master who takes the welfare of the people who work for him seriously. And it's this new knowledge of Darcy that allows Elizabeth to take him seriously as a prospective husband and to begin falling in love with him. In Prom and Prejudice, the equivalent scene starts with Lizzie seeing her idol and favorite classical musician, Claudia Reynolds, who shares the same last name as Darcy's housekeeper, live in concert. And during the intermission, Lizzie receives a written message from Claudia inviting her and her mom for high tea at her house after the concert. And Lizzie is convinced that this has been arranged by her music teacher, Mrs. Gardiner, another name that you will recognize from Pride and Prejudice. That is until she arrives at Claudia's door and it's opened by Darcy himself. So that's when she realizes that Darcy is actually Claudia's son. And after telling her mother that Lizzie is a big fan of hers, she decided to make the offer of the tickets and of the high tea. In his own house, much like in the original novel, uh, when in Pemberley, Darcy goes through a transformation. He's more relaxed, playful, and even flirty, which makes Lizzie perceive him very differently. I looked at him, truly looked at him for the first time in what felt like a long time. 
Claudia invites Lizzie to play the piece she would be performing for her year end recital, complementing her skills and in doing so encouraging her dream of becoming a professional classical musician. In the original novel, Elizabeth's attention is captured by Darcy's portrait, which represents him as a warmer and more approachable person than Lizzie uh, Elizabeth had previously believed him to be. And similar, similarly, Lizzie is drawn to pictures of Darcy on holiday, particularly the more embarrassing ones. And unlike in the original where Darcy uh, is not present, here he is standing next to her and it's his self-deprecating humor that makes him more vulnerable, a vulnerability that is essential for Lizzie to be able to establish a real connection with him. And this chapter actually holds many similarities to the original. The size of Darcy's house here also clearly reflect, reflects his family's wealth. Their house was large and not just by Manhattan standards. It was five stories complete with a screening room, library, music room, billiards room, and a rooftop pool. So pretty nice house all around. Uh, Lizzie also finds, however, that neither Darcy nor his house are as pompous as she had previously expected them to be. And instead, she describes the house as not ostentatious, but roomy and comfortable. But the tour around this grand house doesn't just allow Lizzie to establish a connection with Darcy, but much like in the original, it points her in the right direction for her future career. In Pride and Prejudice, Austen presents Elizabeth's imagined future as mistress of Pemberley as a career in its own right, one which is dependent on her relationship to Darcy, but which is nonetheless has to do with what she will. More than that, Austen characterizes Elizabeth throughout the tour as being completely suitable and prepared for the responsibilities that this position would entail. As she looks around Pemberley, Elizabeth gets to experience firsthand what her life would be like if she were to marry Darcy. By having Lizzie play at Darcy's house, Ulberg does something remarkably similar. During her performance, Lizzie demonstrates her real talent as a classical musician and therefore her ability to be successful in this career that she has chosen for herself. More than that, by observing the lifestyle that can come with a successful career as a classical musician, Lizzie receives an insight into the future wealth and comfort that may one day be her own if she, like Claudia, also succeeds. Class is definitely at play here, as, as I'm sure you can see. And like what Lizzie previously thought, it wasn't her teacher, Mrs. Gardiner, who had enough contacts amongst classical musicians to get her in touch with her idol. It was Darcy who provided this for her. And the implication hangs in the air that Claudia, through Darcy, is perfectly positioned to help advance Lizzie's career and find her opportunities that will help her achieve her dream of becoming a successful classical musician. In this sense, much like in the original, class definitely matters. As a scholarship student with no friends in high places, Lizzie will struggle to succeed in a business that is famously elitist and sexist. However, in contrast to the original, the lifestyle that Lizzie admires in Darcy's house is not so much his own, but the one his mother has provided for her family. In this sense, Lizzie is very much looking at a future that Darcy may play a role in providing, but that, unlike in the original, once her career, role, uh, career goal is accomplished, her wealth and the property that she may decide to buy with it will be her own and no one else's. In the end, much like in the original, this scene in Prom and Prejudice does more than bring Lizzie and Darcy together. It demonstrates Lizzie's suitability for the path that she has chosen. And while it was published in 2014, so just over 200 years after the publication of Pride and Prejudice, the ways in which gender and class work to constrain the female heroine are still very much present here.
that was um, fabulous, Rita. Thank you so much um, for that. Our next speaker is uh, Val, who's just below me here, but probably makes no sense to you on your screen. Um, and I will pass over to you and uh, let you, hopefully your screen sharing all works and, and everything. Okay, thank you. I'll try that. Let's, uh... So hopefully you're able to, to see that. Yeah. yeah, good stuff. Okay, so... Um, just to, to introduce this, I'd, I'd never come across Elizabeth Gunning or any of her works uh, before, uh, around about the second year of my PhD, when I was invited to contribute to the Cambridge Guide to the 18th Century Novel, uh, which was about a number of obscure writers um, of the period. And one of the novels I read was, was this one, uh, The Foresters. Um, so that's uh, now then. I always struggle with this, how to sort of move it on. There's, there's a little arrow somewhere, isn't there? Uh, I'm to move the slides on. If you just click your arrow, it should work like an arrow on your uh, computer. Uh, sorry, just not seeing it. Uh, sorry. Or just oh, click there there it is. I've got it. I've got it. Sorry. Yeah, I can never find that one. I use Teams for. Sorry. Apologies for that. <laughs> okay. Um, so, as I say, I'd never heard of it before, so I'm going to assume that perhaps you haven't heard of her either. Um, but you've heard of her much more famous aunts, the uh, the celebrated Gunning sisters, um, Elizabeth and Maria, who, who are pictured here, who were the sort of celebrated beauties of the age. And you may also have heard of a famous cousin, Lady Elizabeth, Betty uh, Hamilton, who's painted by Romney on the right hand side there. Um, the, the, the Gunning sisters were the beauties of the age and with their beauty becoming the stuff of legend, really, in society. They were the talk of high society. And despite being the children of impoverished, uh, of an impoverished Irish Viscount, they were essentially stalked by the press at the time and a number of aristocratic lords until they made fantastic society marriages, which assured them of their uh, uh, status and wealth for life. Uh, so this is the background uh, that Elizabeth Gunning, the author of The Foresters, uh, had grown up in. And it was a world where, you know, poor women could make fabulous matches by making the right strategic moves. Um, however, uh, when she tried to emulate her aunt's success in an affair which became known as the Gunning Kiad, uh, she was accused of fraud, uh, disgraced and summarily ejected from her family. Her father even sort of slung her out of the house. So here on this slide, these are the main points of the Gunning Kiad, but I'm going to concentrate sort of on the editing process of The Foresters here, because you might think at this point that Elizabeth was finished in society uh, but what she actually achieved was a really clever public relations move uh, to construct and recover her own reputation and sell her novels using this scandal so basically she used her own notoriety to sell her works and she used the textual space of her fiction to repeatedly address the slanderers and even as Pam Park Perkins argues manages to blame them for any fault in the construction of her books claiming that it's because of her, their wrongdoing which has left her friendless and penniless uh, that she's had to force her dormant talents uh, into, into sort of premature development really. Uh, so this story that Gunning tells about her own victimisation of being wronged by her family alongside the sort of slightly scandalous air about has really helped to sell her books um, and it's precisely this good story of scandal and notoriety which I then used <laughs> to market the reasons for republishing this text as a gothic originals to University of Wales Press because obviously they'd never heard of her either uh, and so they were a bit skeptical about her as a writer to start with. So much of my introduction to the text about the Gunning sisters focuses on this Gunning he had and the story behind why Gunning turned to making a living by a pen, how she used her own story to sell her works so basically, I used her notoriety and scandal to sell my book as well, although I got the contract through today and I don't think I'll make much money off it. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the questions from uh, University of Wales Press are, are, are understandable. I mean, and I've had some doubts myself about this book, I've got to say. I personally think Gunning is a really entertaining writer. And the sort of constant aside she uses, uh, addressing her readers, inserting herself into the text, in, inviting the readers into, gives the novels a really kind of modern feel. And it's not like reading a novel from the 18th century in some ways. And there's an example here of how she uses her novels to address her critics. Uh, so this is from an earlier novel, The Packet. In the circles of high life, I know my book will be read, if only for the novelty sake of that name, which has already afforded my dear friends a great deal of subject for conversation, and by their own devices as much delight as can arise from the ingenious fabrications of treachery, falsehoods and malevolence, and these sort of sides of frequent in her novels. 
So I, per I personally, I really love the way she addresses the reader directly and invites them into a world. And, and this is an example from the end of the reading I've shared with you uh, previously. Uh, so the emphasis on the you, you sigh, you return to Paris, you are out of, you are fatigued, melancholy, reminded me of those choose your own adventure books, which were popular when I was a child. Or well, more recently, I don't know if you're aware of this author, Drew Gummerson, who actually um, published through one of our alumni at Derby's uh, publishing houses. He's adapted this form in his hilarious novel Seven Nights at the Flamingo Hotel which has just been described in review by the TLS as indecently Bukowskian and it's this type of device along with her use of textual space to address critics and readers directly which make reading her works I think a really immersive experience. Okay. So aside from me using the same techniques as gunning to market a text, there have been a few kind of frustrations along the way as well. So some of this relates to imposter syndrome um, and questions surrounding kind of who am I really to rediscover this author? And actually, there might be a really good reason why it's not been published in 1796, which kind of worries me a bit. <laughs> um, you know, I can imagine there are undeniably moments in her novels when I can imagine the dismay of uh, University of Wales Press Executive Board if their tastes don't match mine uh, and they really don't like this novel when they see in its entirety. And, and then you get things like this on the left hand slide here. So basically, this not, is a novel that hasn't been republished since 1796, and it really only exists in scan on 18th century collections online. So, I, you know, what does the series editor do here? You know, I, I don't know. I don't really remember receiving any editorial training during my PhD, so I'm kind of making this up as I go along. Is it going to lead to expensive research trips to a library if I can find one that holds a copy of this book? I think there's a copy in the John Rylands Library in Manchester, but it's on a microfiche, and I don't know how you feel about those, but I really hate them. They make me feel sick, so I don't know how it's going to go. And what struck me most, really, all these points aside, is... Um, it, even with a sort of PhD in 18th century uh, literature, I started my career, my first ever job was kind of junior secretary and I had about five years working as a secretary before I went to university at all. And I think the best qualification I hold for this is an RS3 A3 in typing, but it's basically a copy typing exercise, isn't it really? To sort of make it into this, this, this book. So I actually heard today, I well, actually heard yesterday that they'd approved it, um, the uh, uh, the publication, the executive board. Um, so basically, I've, all I've got to do now is to type up four volumes of this novel with notes as fast as I can to meet the deadline. Uh, that's me, so I'll stop sharing. Thanks. <laughs> okay, well, sorry, I turned, I turned off my screen because you were, sometimes you went a little bit slow and it sometimes, like if you turn off videos, it, it goes a little bit faster um, for that. But what a, yeah, what a fantastic talk and what a really interesting, um, insight into the editing process um and um, ho hopefully there'll be um sort of interesting questions about that i think it would be, it would be nice maybe in the next hour to go back to that the, the page where you said what what do we do with this and i i, I want to ask you like what did you do with that where where the text like literally disappears into the i haven't it, done anything it, with it yet yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, this could actually be useful. We could all help you and go like, what would we do with this? Um, this it, I, I would really appreciate that. <laughs> Fantastic. So our next speaker is Tim, um, who's going to talk about uh, the conduct book literature of the On Guard Tailors. But I'm also going to help him out and share his screen because we had some, we discovered some technical difficulties. So I'll share my screen and you can do you can do your best, Professor Chris Whitty, Tim, and say <laughs> next slide, please, when you when when it gets to the right place. So let me just get. I actually there. said that, yeah, the whole pandemic. So it'll be. It'll oh, it's, be it's a, a new. It's it's it's, <laughs> it's the it's the opportunity you've been waiting for. Let me just see. So we, can, um, we can all see that, right? Perfect. Fine. Fine. Great. Okay. Um, well, it's really great to be here. So thank you so much for um, introducing and organising all this, Andy. Um, I wanted to spend the duration of my talk um, introducing you all to the Taylor family of Onga. Um, so I'd like to just cover quickly uh, who they were, why they were so popular in their day, and um, why they challenged the critical tradition's historical attitudes towards both youth and teenagers, um, and also conduct literature. Conduct books have long had a reputation for being dull and spiritless. Um, this is probably, um, I'm guessing, your kind of blanket association of conduct books um, here today. Um, I'm here to change that. Um, so um, I'd like to propose the Young Artillers to you as just one example, and there are many more, um, of writers of conduct books who challenge the notion that the genre was necessarily conservative, 
um, and who encouraged tolerant approaches to both teenage resistance and to a limited extent, um, teenage ridiculousness. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> um, so um, this is a, a quick summary of uh, the, the Taylors. Um, you can see that Isaac Taylor is at the top. He is one of three Isaac Taylors. So this is actually Isaac Taylor II. Uh, he married Anne Taylor, and you can see that their six children are um, named on the screen on the left. If you recognize the portrait on the right, it's because it's, a, it's very prominently placed in the Natural Portrait Gallery, and this is done by Isaac Taylor. He was an engraver and illustrator, as well as a writer. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, um, Isaac, uh, sorry, just my place, sorry. Um, so Isaac Taylor was an um, evangelical minister uh, who lived from 1759 to 1829. After achieving success in London and Colchester, he moved to Ongar in Essex with his wife Anne in 1786 to translate his sermons into illustrated conduct books. He was a passionate advocate of female talent and so encouraged his wife and his children to begin parallel literary projects of their own at the same time. By the end of the 1810s, their resultant productions had ushered the Taylor family into a sort of literary stardom. The myriad novels and conduct books of both Isaac and Anne Taylor were largely addressed to what they termed teens, and many ran through 10 or 12 editions. The Taylor children achieved similar success. Aged 22, 21 and 17 respectively, Anne Junior, um, actually, sorry, could I go back a slide? Um, sorry, um, Andy. Um, so Anne Junior, so the, the eldest Anne, Jane and Isaac Junior, so Isaac the uh, third, their first best-selling book, Original Poems in 1804, ran through at least seven editions in its first year of publication and over 30 more editions by 1834. Collectively, the Taylor family would go on to publish nearly 30 works between them and are now acknowledged to be, quote, amongst the most famous and prolific children's authors and illustrators of the 19th century. Indeed, Tim, Chil Tim Chilcott notes that they were the greatest successes and the most profitable writers that their publisher ever enlisted. And this was the same firm that published, among others, Keats, Coleridge, Hazlitt, De Quincey and John Clare. You may be thinking, um, as I'm saying all this, that's all well and good, but if they were really that popular, then why haven't I heard more of them? I put it to you that you may not have heard the names of the Taylors, but you will actually already be familiar with a lot of their stories, poems and ideas, given how in integrated they've become in the British cultural heritage of childhood. For instance, you might not think you've heard of Jane Taylor's 1806 poem entitled The Star, whereas in reality, I'm sure you could instantly recite the entirety of at least its first stanza. Its first line begins, twinkle, twinkle, little star. The conduct books of the Taylors provide a useful challenge to the critical tradition because their progressive values are asserted because of their evangelical Christianity, as opposed to despite it. Believing that even the most perfect exhibition of proper conduct could not earn salvation, the Taylors insisted that the genuine spiritual maturation of teenagers should not be sacrificed to a misleading and idolatrous fixation on the kind of conduct desirable to polite but secular society. Moreover, because the Taylors believed that each individual young soul was of equal and infinite importance, the writing also explicitly rejects and transcends the traditional hierarchies of age and gender, assumed by the critical tradition's notion of idealized propriety. That same propriety assumed by, for example, Mary Poovey's proper lady. These applications of theology were markedly different to those seen in the conduct books of previous Christian moralists of the early 18th, of the early and mid 18th century. Um, the most kind of prominent conduct writers that we would, that we would know today would be um, writers such as Fordyce and Gregory. Um, these emphasized a particular emphasis on young females in particular, but the Taylors subscribed to a combination of both theological and secular utilitarian arguments, um, which interpreted the soul of the youngest daughter of a family to be of equal importance to its patriarchal head. Because they insisted that, I quote, in Christ there is neither male nor female, the Taylors were thus able to reject many of the traditionally segregated secular arrangements of gendered domesticity. 
In their own household, for instance, the tailored daughters were all apprenticed into their father's business alongside their sons, and they loudly relished the opportunity. The same egalitarianism, egalitarianism guided the tailor's pedagogical system. Regardless of sex, the tailor children were all home educated in the same gender neutral program of Isaac's own devising, comprising literature, art, mathematics, and the sciences. Um, if the tailor's egalitarian stance regarding teenage conduct already renders them distinct from previous more conservative conduct writers, the advocacy of adult teen equality further highlights their progressiveness. Um, can I go back to that slide, please, Andy? In perhaps their largest point of departure from their conservative forebears, the tailors insisted that the parent teen relationship be both neutral and reciprocal. Um, in contrast to the old 18th century model, in which the honour and obedience of the child was an obligation necessarily owed to parents, the tailors deliberately inverted this principle by insisting that teams themselves were owed honour and respect equally as much. Isaac says, duties are always reciprocal. It were unjust to expect all and yield nothing. Because the, read the tailors' readers were still exhorted to be obedient to their parents, even in those cases when they, the parents, I quote, required too much of them. Isaac explained that it was only therefore just and fair that parent-child obligations were affected both ways. You expect much from your father, he says. You are right to do so. Your relationship warrants it. Similarly, Anne perceived parenting reciprocity to be so important that she dedicated an entire treatise to the theme. Reciprocal duties of parents and children address both teenagers and adults of both sexes alternately and was composed for the stated purpose of, um, next slide please, reminding those parents who had forgotten that there is a respect due to the young as well as to the old. Calling on parents to enact a sort of um, Smithian notion of sympathy, that's Adam Smith, Anne argued that to withhold teens from enjoying those advantages which belong to their circumstances and their age is unjust and cruel. Lest it be repeated, the mourning of life should be held sacred by parents. To ascertain what are the just claims of others upon us, it is always requisite to imagine ourselves in their circumstances and they in ours. It is only by doing so that the golden rule of duty to our neighbour can be applied. What a surprising change would take place in some families if this simple process were suddenly to commence. So you can see in this quote that Anne's evangelicalism leads us to combine the secular Smithian concept of imaginative sympathy with the biblical commandment that Jesus identified as the most important golden rule of scripture, love thy neighbour as thyself. With this scriptural mandate, uh, next slide please, uh, Anne consequently, actually that might be the same slide, Anne consequently interprets harsh or tyrannous parents to be not only uncaring but also inherently sinful. Referencing the transgressive predisposition of iniquitous, iniquitous sorry, human nature, she explains that self-will in a parent is tyranny. The obedience it exacts from the family is not that of sons, but of slaves. Some persons under the idea of main maintaining parental authority assume the character rather of the master than of the father. Published after the heightened state surveillance retrospectively dubbed Pip's Terror, Anne's careful evocation of the evangelical notion of the fallen state of man diverts what would otherwise be quite a revolutionary and politically subversive critique of tyrannous authority into a more abstract statement regarding universally sinful human nature. She concludes that truly virtuous parents must treat their children with respect and leniency if they were not to abuse that power divinely entrusted to them. So I'll close on this. Um, so this is the Taylor's notion, um, their condemnation really, of what they call the unhappy effects of traditional and conservative notions of domestic life, as well as modern scholarships, associations of conduct books with conservatism. To the Taylors, honours was not honour was not something that was unconditionally owed to parents, but which parents must themselves both earn and return. This principle grows all the more striking when again contextualized within that gender neutral setting of reciprocal duties. By addressing parents and teenagers of both sexes simultaneously, reciprocal duties suggest that even the male patriarchal head of the family was not worthy of the respect of his children unless he himself practiced a sufficiently respectful style of parenting. 
even from the youngest female and most powerful, powerless members of his own family. Far from threatening and cajoling young girls into the self-effacing submissiveness of a patriarchal conception of the idealized proper lady, the tailor's evangelicalism led them therefore to replace a vertically arranged domestic hierarchy with a horizontally arranged spiritual one. In the Christian family, they argued, all souls were equal and no male or female teenager was due any more or less honor than anyone else. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, that was fantastic. And like, I, I feel like I've learned so much about the, the, the tailors that I, like, that I ought to have known before, but like absolutely didn't. So that was fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, um, next up is Anna, who's gonna tell us about um, Susan Ferrier's marriage. Hello everyone. Uh, I just nearly clicked the leave button instead of the share button, which would not have been the right thing to do. Um, just a second. Okay, can you all see my PowerPoint and can you all hear me? Yep, and yep. Fantastic. Um, so thank you all, all. <laughs> I don't think there's many of us, but thank you for coming today. I'm going to be talking about Susan Ferrier's 1818 novel, Marriage, which is a novel that, mar uh, and, uh, it is not a novel that marriage is on focus. It is a novel that focuses on marriage, but in particular, how education leads people to make either good or bad marriage choices. And I'm pretty sure you're familiar with the novel, but if not, I've got a short little recap just to remind you, or if you haven't read it yet, just to let you know what goes on in it. So it starts off with Lady Juliana, who has to make a decision uh, whether, whether to marry for money or love. Having been educated by her father in external accomplishments only, she chooses the latter, marrying for love, and quickly regrets it. After giving birth to twin daughters, she returns to London with one of her daughters who she raises like herself and who, when faced with the same decision, chooses to marry for money and also later reject, uh, uh, also later wishes that she hasn't regret. That is the word I was looking for. The other twin, however, Juliana rejects. And this twin is raised in Scotland by her aunt, Alicia Douglas. And Alicia names the second twin, Mary. And it is Mary's education that is the focus of the passage that we're looking at today. And just prior to the passage, we are told that Alicia, quote, read much and reflected more, and many faultless theories of education had floated in her mind, end quote. But in the end, she rejects them all because all teaching theories have to have errors because all teachers have um, a tendency to make errors. Within the passage itself, we have Mary's three maiden great, great aunts, and they are shocked and appalled by Alicia's decision not to follow a formal educational system. They prefer the methods that they have used to raise their nieces. And much of the humor and the ridiculousness comes through the depiction of their niece's education and their achievements that are both ineffective and worthy of ridicule. But marriage tempers what could have been a really didactic narrative with raucous humor and a keen eye towards how children and young people effectively learn. So the maiden sisters emphasize the importance of filling a young person with knowledge, cramming their heads full of as much as they possibly can. But Alicia Douglas, on the other, on the other hand, rejects theories and instead works to develop the religious, moral and intellectual capacities of her charge. And although this contrast engages with the educational theories of the early 19th century, I argue that Ferrier anticipates late 20th century and 21st century pedagogical theories and approaches. And I think she does this in two ways. I think, first of all, she shows the importance of cultivating a student's abilities as opposed to just filling them um, with information. And secondly, she foregrounds the importance of interpersonal relationships in the educational process. 
Um, and I'm just going to talk about the first one of those two points um, today. And I'm sure that most of us teach at our universities, so we can think of ourselves as educators. And I think sometimes as educators, we get really caught up with the idea of old fashioned education. And we think that everything in the past um, used to be very um, formal with victims that were mere automated receptors of knowledge. So I think we kind of think of the Victorians basically. And that is definitely part of what happened um, in the past, at least here in the UK. Uh, so this is a quotation from the 1861 Newcastle Commission that praised the school, um, saying that the object of educating poor children is to be contented and useful in their own sphere of life, apart from views of personal advancement. If we compare that to what we say today, this is from a 2016 government white paper, um, we can see the difference. So this quotation um, says that pupils should be developed into being resilient, knowing how to persevere, how to bounce back if faced with failure, and how to collaborate with others at work and in their private lives. So generally, we see, and I think we always have in our mind that there's been this transition between education as a form of just telling people what to think to helping them think for themselves. And we see this in theory too. So Dennis Fox categorizes teachers' perceptions of their role as educators into five theories. So the first one is the transfer theory, just you fill a student up with all of the knowledge that you think it's necessary for them to have. Then you have the shaping theory, which is you mold the student into who you think they should be. Then there's the building theory, which we're not going to talk about today. Uh, then there's the traveling theory, where the teacher is a guide, and the growing theory, in which the teacher helps the student grow some plants instead of others and encourages cultivation in some that would otherwise have been neglected. And Fox calls the first two simple. Sorry, the first two theories, simple theories. So the idea that you teach by filling or shaping, these are, these are kind of quite simple approaches and they tend to be held by more inexperienced and ineffective teachers. But the final two, the traveling and growing theories represent more experienced views of teaching. And when a teacher has these theories in their mind, they're more likely to be effective. But from the outsider's perspective, they look a little bit hands off. And even though I've said that we can see this transi transition over time, we can also see it within the novel itself. Um, so I think kind of the overall point that I'm saying actually is Feria is doing something very modern in this novel. So in the passage that I've shared, the maiden aunts subscribe to the simple theories. So their pedagogy is all about cramming as much as possible into the girls' minds. Miss Jackie thinks that young people never could have enough said to them. They teach the girls to remember sermons, to play the spinet, to read badly, to write badly, to knit stockings, to scold servants, cement china, trim bonnets, lecture the poor and look up to Lady McCluckin. McCluckin. Mary, on the other hand, seems to have nothing said to her, no knowledge imparted. And that, of course, great, causes great confusion and consternation. So Miss Grizzy says, it really appears as if Mary, poor thing, was getting no education at all. And yet she can do things too. I don't understand it. So whereas the nieces become as rid ridiculous as their aunts and their achievements are laughably underwhelming, Mary grows up as a novel standard heroine. Years before Fox, therefore, I say that we see his theories in at work. So to conclude, the structure of Ferrier's novel is didactic, but the novel itself doesn't feel so because she uses humor. We see a simple theory of education and a developed theory of education in practice, and we laugh at the simple one. So as with Mary, the reader learns by not being lectured at. They learn through the experience of laughing instead of just being told what to think. And I think this makes this novel 
um, very modern and very relevant, particularly to those of us involved in education. So thank you. Um, fantastic and um, sort of like, like I, I like it. I, I love it when an evening comes together and it feels like the, the, there were sort of threads there um, between Tim's and, and yours talks and then I was I got very excited and possibly Hannah did too because I, I, I'm sure I recognised one of the images from like Hannah, Hannah from Hannah's original pitch, um, the, um, the, the 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 caricature that you shared. I was like, I had I had like a moment of confusion about who had sent uh, who had sent what. But anyway, I, we we we're going on to hear from Hannah now, so we might be able to make more links um, between what is going on. Over yes, thank Hannah. you. Yeah, it's great to be here this evening. So yeah, drawing so many links and getting so many ideas that uh, will connect to to my paper. So I'll just. Uh start sharing my screen. Hopefully it's uh, coming up. Can you see it okay? Yeah, it, you, if you start the slideshow, we should, we, it should be bigger because at the moment we can see the, the, the kind of pre-slideshow image. Ah, so my screen's got the actual slideshow. Oh. We can do you. You can you can be Chris Whitty again, and I'll share the. <laughs> the I think it might be. Do you have two screens? It might. The, 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 no, I haven't got two screens, screens on. But yeah, mine is in presentation mode at the beginning. But uh, you've not got that. If I stop share. Yeah. Do you want me to share? And I'll I'll, I'll just I'll find. If you've you got what. it to hand, that yeah, I've got it on there. I've got it on the Google Drive. So I'll I'll, I'll actually I'll just I'll oh, get it on first, and then I will pop it on. Let me just find it. Do I have it? What do I do? I can't find it now. Oh. <laughs> oh. Let me it here. Okay. I'm sure I put that up. Oh, never mind. No, no. I pressed the wrong button now. Wait, like, just amuse yourselves during these technical difficulties. <laughs> It's typical that it worked when we uh, practiced it. So yeah. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Right. It's open. It's just opening. Oh, I'm thinking about opening. There we go. So I will share my screen. So you didn't have. You didn't get an insight into my messy laptop. There we go. Okay. So when oh, are ready and, and just remind me when things are going. Will do. So the article on female accomplishments published in the Satirist or Monthly Meteor of July 1812, I've chosen to discuss this evening, presents a humorously grotesque verbal portrait of a young girl attempting to use her talents to make a good marriage. However, beneath the playfully savage wit, the piece reveals how issues of class and gender intersect with ideas on natural talent and the provision of education for girls. I first came across this article whilst uh, researching the artistic education open to girls for my PhD thesis on the representation of the artist heroine in British women's writing. And whilst, of course, I found lots of debates surrounding female education, I was struck by this particularly vivid picture of a young girl trying and failing to be deemed accomplished. To give a brief synopsis, the article is presented as a letter from a concerned citizen who has just returned from the home of the Mushroom family, where he has accompanied his heartbroken friend Mr Thornville on a restorative visit. Thornville's fiance has recently died, and so Miss Mushroom has been lined up by his father as a suitable replacement, and she's only too ready to display her artistic accomplishments to impress her gentleman callers. But what does accomplishment entail? And so next slide, please. Um, so perhaps the most famous discussion of what makes a young lady worthy of being considered accomplished comes from this frequently cited passage from Pride and Prejudice. You have to get the, the Jane Austen mention in on her birthday, as Rita said. Um, so this is where Caroline Bingley outlines what she believes it means to be truly accomplished. The long list of skills and attributes required by Miss Bingley exemplifies what Anne Birmingham refers to as the trope of lack within the discourse of female accomplishment. 
despite the verb accomplish, meaning to finish, women are expected to acquire ever more accomplishments in order to attract a husband, supposedly. Miss Bingley snidely takes advantage of the unquantifiable nature of accomplishments, um, noting the certain something required, and uses it as a form of social gatekeeping to exclude those she considered considers an inferior, a point only emphasised by the fact that Elizabeth Bennet replies that she has never seen such a woman. Here Austin is responding to the accomplishment debates waged throughout the long 18th century. Carol Shiner Wilson notes that by the 1790s accomplishment had become a code word for dangerous idle upper class pastimes of women who were self-absorbed and neglectful of their families. However, the issue was not restricted to the upper echelons of society. Um, so next slide, please. Um, seeing the danger in educating a woman beyond her station in life, Hannah Moore used her strictures on the modern system of female education of 1799 to warn against an excessive cultivation of the arts. Conflating usefulness and virtue, Moore describes the frenzy of accomplishment as a contagion infecting the lower orders, as pretensions to elegance prevent them from making a valid contribution to society. Conduct advice published throughout the long 18th century often comes with such a class proviso. Ornamental accomplishments were seen as being less useful, meaning that the lower ranks only needed to be educated according to their domestic situation and not leisure. But to focus on the article from the satirist, we learn that the Mushroom family are new money, with the recently retired Mr Mushroom having gained a comfortable independence from his business dealings. Although their financial standing means that Thornville's father considers an alliance very desirable, the Mushroom's shameless promotion of their daughter bespeaks of vulgarity, pride, insolence and affection, according to the writer. And next slide, please. Um, the much anticipated arrival of Miss Jezebel Mushroom ultimately proves a disappointment due to her corpulence, her claw-like feet, yellow teeth and red complexion, not to mention the prominent wart on the end of her nose. Her appearance rules her out of being considered an accomplished female even before she has had a chance to display her talents. Her very name introduces her as a sexually predatory Je Jezebel, and the later comparison of her attitude to that of a nymph of Billingsgate likens her to a prostitute touting for custom. Furthermore, the name Mushroom metaphorically speaks of her inflated proportions, whilst the influence of the ideal of accomplishment could e easily spread like a fungus as girls seek to replicate or exceed the accomplishments of their rivals. Unfortunately, Miss Mushroom is lacking in skill as well as beauty. She produces bad drawings, plays the wrong notes on the harpsichord, and stammers over her pronunciation when speaking French. The writer goes on and on with his blazon of imperfections, describing how her faults are augmented, not improved, by her pursuit of accomplishment. When the arts serve to heighten rather than disguise her so-called deformities, Physical appearance becomes a means of instantly recognising a woman's accomplishment, or rather, lack of it. Deirdre Lynch has described how 18th century writers wield the image of the disfigured, overloaded body as a strategy to reinforce ostensibly natural proportions between land and money, labour and commodities. The physical appearance of an accomplished young woman can thus provide a commentary on her position in society. And given that the term caricature has its roots in the idea of excess, the figure of the accomplished stri female striving to acquire an ever increasing list of skills is ripe for satire. And we've had the next slide, please. We've got a familiar image coming up. Um, so indeed, the inflated appearance of Miss Mushroom resembles that of Betty Giles in James Gilray's satirical print, Farmer Giles and his wife showing off their daughter Betty to their neighbours on her return from school from 1809. So the girl sat at the square piano only pleases her ambitious parents and her appearance suggests that she lacks accomplishment without the need to actually hear her musical performance. However, Gilray does manage to convey the unpleasant sound through the reaction of a rather downcast looking dog you can see um, in, in the centre. There's an implication that the family has grown too big for their sphere in this overcrowded drawing room. 
and the in inflated sense of importance is conveyed by the size of the Giles family in comparison with their guests and the very small servant in the corner who is practically the size of one of Farmer Giles's legs. But back to Miss Mushroom. Although she is presented as a rather ridiculous figure, she's not the main target of this satire. Fulfilling the, um, the satirist's uh, large aim, which was to expose impostors, the blame is laid squarely on her parents for encouraging the pursuit of an unachievable ideal standard. Um, if we have the next slide, please. And the, the writer states, I could not help seriously reflecting on the folly of the mushrooms in giving their daughter such an education as they had endeavoured to bestow. With a plain education adapted to her humble capacity, Miss Jezebel might have passed through life in a great measure unnoticed, as her defects would have been much less prominent than they at present appear. The writer concludes with the claim that he will practice what he preaches when educating his own daughter, declaring that he shall confine her studies to plain household duties unless it should appear that she has a she has really a talent for acquiring more elegant accomplishments. Whilst on the one hand this sounds particularly restrictive, it does perhaps inadvertently highlight the nature of the individual and the importance of honing natural talent, which cannot be inherited or bought necessarily. The writer presents a harsh misogynistic commentary on female lack in a publication scathingly criticised as so void of taste and real wit and so very illiberal in their abuse. But ultimately the satire does show the need to carefully consider the education of daughters. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. And it was so lovely to see the, the James Gilray picture like uh, uh, in, in, in various um, presentations and maybe we'll go back to having a look uh, at that during the, the conversation. Our final speaker of the evening and then maybe we'll have a sort of short comfort break um, is um, Rosie. But la last but not least, we're going to hear about Keats's silliest letter, which I'm very excited to learn more of. Thank you. I'm just going to um, move my cat who has been sat on my lap yes, this whole cat. time. She's been so good, but um, I think I need to sort of sit up properly. So I'm just gonna <laughs> <laughs> put her over there. Well, that was very exciting. We <laughs> like, we're like an animal um, activity. <laughs> right, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Um, so can you just see the PowerPoint? You can't see anything else? Is that... yeah. yeah, okay, great. On the 14th of September, 1817, John Keats wrote a letter to Jane and Marianne Reynolds, sisters of his friend, John Hamilton Reynolds, and with whom he kept up a mild epistolary flirtation. It's easy to dismiss this letter as a bit of playful larking about, but this is to ignore the subtle and brilliant ways in which Keats uses the letter form, not only to entertain the Reynolds sisters, but to demonstrate the fluidity and malleability of letters, letter writing, and the identity of the letter writer. Keats wrote this letter at about the time he was writing book three of Endymion, his uh, attempt at an epic, uh, in which the eponymous hero journeys through the mighty deeps of the monstrous sea. So in the letter, Keats writes, I made a little mistake just now when I talked of being far inland. How can that be when Endymion and I are at the bottom of the sea? Whence I hope to bring him in safety, he means safely, I think, before you leave the seaside. And if I can so contrive it, you shall be greeted by him on the sands, and he shall tell you all his adventures, which at having finished, he shall thus proceed. So now Keats is handing over to Endymion the character, who then says, my dear ladies, however my friend Keats may have teased and vexed you, believe me, he loves you not the less. For instance, I am deep in his favour, and yet he has been hauling me through earth and sea with unrelenting perseverance. I know for all this, he is mightily fond of me by his contriving me all sorts of pleasures, he sends you moreover this little scroll. So now Endymion is reading a scroll written by Keats, which says, my dear girls, I send you per favour of Endymion, the assurance of my esteem of you and my utmost wishes for your health and pleasure, being ever your affectionate brother, John Keats. Integrating his title character into the space of the letter indicates how easily textual and physical realities can merge for Keats. He disrupts the conventionally singular voice of the letter writer by introducing Endymion as a second speaker, who in turn addresses the Reynolds sisters by reading to them a message from John Keats. 
Layers of epistolary personae make up this letter, and as such, it requires extra effort on the part of the reader to conjecture precisely which of the selves Keats creates has become the John Keats who puts his name at its close. So Keats crosses the boundary between letter and poem by bringing Endymion into the letter. His choice of langu language elsewhere in the same letter does more to challenge conventional linguistic structures. Being far from home when he was writing the letter, his home being Hampstead Heath, Keats asks that his sincerest respects might be paid to his landlady, Mrs. Dilk, and to let her know that I have not forgiven myself for not having got her that little box of medicine I promised for her after dinner flushings, and that had I remained at Hampstead, I would have made precious havoc with her house and furniture, drawn a great harrow over her garden, poisoned boxer, that's the dog, eaten her clothes pegs, fried her cabbages, fricasseed, how is it spelt, her ravishes, ragooed her onions, belaboured her beetroot, outstripped her scarlet runners, parlez-voued with her French beans, devoured her mignon or mignonette, metamorphosed her bell handles, splintered her looking glasses, bullocked at her cups and saucers, agonised her decanters, put old Phillips, the gardener, to pickle in the brine tub, disorganised her piano, dislocated her candlesticks, emptied her wine bins in a fit of despair, turned out her maid to the grass, and astonished Brown, that's Keats's friend Charles Brown, whose letter to her on these events I would rather see than the original copy of the book of Genesis. With this erratic list of irregular actions, Keats presents the Reynolds sisters with an alternate version of himself wreaking precious havoc in an alternate Hampstead. In keeping with the tone of the letter, this passage is certainly meant to entertain, but it also functions as a shrewd renegotiation of language and identity. Keats's letters and the manuscripts of his poems are famously full of misspellings, their frequent frequency indicating for Christopher Ricks an ever-diminishing likelihood of coincidence. Rather than mistakes, Keats's frequent and probably deliberate misspellings challenge conventional linguistic structures, just as in the above passage his deliberate and unconventional use of structure, grammar and language work to undo certain epistolary expectations. By coupling each item in his list here with an unusual choice of verb, Keats creates a jarring series of images that forces readers to engage on a sensory level, rather than by clearly associating action with object. This generates two outcomes, the first of which is that Keats dehumanises himself. He becomes a creature who eats clothes pegs and bullocks at cups. His actions even amount to something like sorcery as he metamorphoses the bell handles. Keats's alternate self sits somewhere between the animal and the supernatural, comically absurd and at liberty to upset domestic and linguistic order. Just as Keats takes on these unnatural qualities, so too do the household items develop their own. Mrs. Dilk's decanters are agonised, her candlesticks dislocated. Inanimate objects are animated into a rhetoric of bodily discomfort, while human becomes animal or magical even. Verbs and objects are naturally forced together allow Keats to refigure the domestic space of the home, upset linguistic conventions, and challenge the boundaries of identity. This is a silly letter, but it is also a letter in which Keats deliberately challenges ideas of form and obscures the identity of the letter writer. And in so doing, he demonstrates how the letter is for him both an instrument of play and a means of renegotiating the boundary between imagined realities and the empirically real. Thank you. That was uh, fantastic. Thank you so much. And rounded off um, our sort of talking part of the evening um, beautifully. I feel like I may, I, I may have gone sort of on and on in my introduction, so we're a little bit over time, but I still, still think it would be worth having a short break uh, where we can sort of stretch our legs, go to the loo, get another drink um, or, or the other thing, and then come back uh, ready to uh, um, ask each other and answer questions from the audience. So sort of audience, thank you for staying with us. For a while, we were slightly over uh, there was slightly more of you than there was of us, uh, but I think we're sort of we're, we're shrinking a little bit now. But if you, like if you have any questions for us, please put your questions in the um, the, the Q and A slot. But you could also go off and, and stretch your legs and uh, get a mince pie, for example, um, uh, if you wish. So should we, we, we let's reconvene at twenty five at at, at seven twenty five. So in four minutes, so we can have a, a quick dash. Uh, to wherever we need to go, and then we will um, we, we will reconvene for 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 a chat.
So um, I remember to pause during the break, sort of, so no one had to wait through that bit when they were catching up on the um, recording. We already have a question, which is very exciting. Um, and Mo so I'm going to go straight. I'm going to let Molly have the first question rather than go for chair's privilege. So Molly says, thanks, everyone, for the round table. I enjoyed it very much. I have a cue for Andy. Oh, it's for me as well. I, now I feel now I feel kind of guilty about going for your <laughs> first, Molly. Uh, I'm currently researching Phantasmian as one of my core texts on my PhD and have been thinking about its suitability as a children's novel. It's incredibly complex. I agree. Dense, unillustrated and strikingly macabre. In one of Sari's letters, she says that the Ongar Taylor's original poems is too morbid compared to Mary Howitt's sketches of natural history, which I find interesting. So a link to the um, tailors. Anyway, what are your thoughts on Phantasmian's appropriateness for the romantic slash Victorian child and how this connects to current debates about how much horror, for want of a better world, should, where children should be exposed to in fiction? Thanks. Thank you, Molly, for your question. I was, I, I've been wrestling with whether or not Phantasmian is a children's novel as well. Like it's a, it's a fairy tale, but it's sort of depiction of kind of adult desires and adult relationships is, ex is, 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 as you say, sort of extremely complex and sort of quite, sort of it functioned for a lot of the time above my head. So I wondered if I, I, maybe maybe children are sort of more, are, are more able to sort of keep track of extremely complex relationships than, than I was, um, or they, they, they might, like me, be more interested in, in Phantasmian's various um, transfigurations into um, insects. Which, I, which which is what kept me going um, through the text. But yeah, appropriateness is, is is a really interesting question about children's texts. I think that children's texts in the 18th century, at least, had a sort of I, I think they had kind of higher expectations of what children were able to sort of deal with. So the first children's novel, Sarah Fielding's The Governess, um, has a has a, a ex extraordinarily high body count. Like loads of people die in it, but also these girls who range from like well under 10 to like their early teens, they read um, like an, an, an early early 18th century or late 17th century kind of comedy, which I think would be well beyond kind of six to 13 year olds abilities nowadays. Um, and uh, even though they're fictional, there's a sort of there's an assumption that the girls are able to do what 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 you would ex what you'd be expecting girls to cope with at that age. So it's sort of interesting what what we expect of children nowadays compared with what was expected of them back in the day. Um, but like, and another thing that I I think in in relation to your last question about how much horror children to, today should deal with is that like my, my suspicion is that children love dark stuff. Um, so my Christmas recommendation to you all is is Netflix. No, Nightbooks, which is on Netflix, which is like a, a, a modern retelling of Hansel and Gretel with the woman from Jessica Jones as like a wicked witch in it. And it's fantastic, but sort of aimed aimed like uh, aimed at a kind of youthful audience, but like very kind of psychologically disturbing as well as kind of jump scare horror. Yeah, so that's my that that's that's my answer to to, to sort of Molly's various questions. There was a sort of there, there was a shout out to the um, Taylor's original poems there, Tim. How how morbid did you think they were? Um, they, uh, it's a really good question. Um, it's it's kind of um, I I would kind of almost link it to um Hannah's talk um they're kind of more than in a, in a very playful sarcastic way um so actually my suspicion if I can't remember who you said was it Pen Pennington who who had that response to the Taylor's um Molly but it, my suspicion is it might actually be a misreading it might be that she missed the intended sarcasm behind um the supposed macabre um as many people did um so um but yeah I, I, I have actually I wasn't familiar with that reference so um if you um, please put the, the kind of citation in the chat, I'd love to check it out. Thank you for that. It's, it's what it's uh, in Sarah Coleridge's letter. She talks. She says oh, Sarah Coleridge, yeah. compared to Mary Howitt's sketches of natural history. So that's sort of yeah. It's in the if you open the Q and A um, box, you'll see you you can see the question. And it gives oh you, yeah, perfect. It gives you a Thank you. Of link. Um, do you, I'm. I'm, so I've taken the first question, and then I then I bounce the next question on to Tim. And as we like, we sort of the the men are in the minority here. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask in general: is is there a question that the rest of you would like to ask one of one of you, or is there a question from uh, our attendees? Rita has a hand up. Go on. You're gonna have to unmute though. 
well that would help wouldn't it <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I made I was very excited and made what are very confusing notes but I'm going to try and, uh, and bring these into a coherent question so I have a question for Anna and Hannah uh, since I think there were some very nice connections uh, between your two papers and uh, my, my brain was just going off thinking about examples of representations of female accomplishments and um, I'm so glad you presented on Susan Ferrier's Marriage, Anna, because it's one of my favorite novels and Ferrier doesn't get the attention she deserves. Um, and I was thinking about the aunts in particular, like, like, like how you were talking about them. And there's a scene where they're talking about, oh yes, this young lady who produced, I forget exactly what it was, some piece of embroidery or something she made and that her father, you know, was very annoyed at how much it cost at the time, but then it's so nice having, you know, being able to show it. And I think this is kind of portrayed by Ferrier as an example of wastefulness that comes from this culture of accomplishments. Um, and I was thinking also of uh, the filigree basket, um, in sense and sensibility that is something that's really expensive and difficult to make and it's just given to children who will you know tear it apart so I was wondering what you thought of this uh, of the idea of wastefulness in um, within this dialogue on accomplishments and the I and the the connections between money and spending money and the usefulness of the objects produced and I'm sorry if this makes absolutely no sense I just got way too excited thinking about this it makes a lot of sense to me I'll just jump in um, and, and say that and I'm trying to remember I loved everybody's papers and I tried to make notes but already they've all merged into like one fantastic paper all together and I don't remember who said what and about what but someone was talking about um, excess this there's too much too much of everything um, and when you were asking the question um, Rika, I was thinking not just of the the waste of money and expense, but I think the waste of time is a really big concern. People really concentrating on stuff that's not needed, it's not wanted, they're not cultivating their own minds, they're not doing anything to help anyone, they're just wasting their times. And I think in, in the caricatures, we see that also with physical bodies, the idea of the body being um, I think I'm remembering who was talking about too much. It was the um, Miss Mushroom, wasn't it? And, um, you know, she's physically too much. She's, she's, she's slightly larger. And you could, you almost imagine she probably talks a little bit too loudly as well. And it's, it's too much. It's too much. Um, and that's not really an answer, but that's just what came into my head straight away. So I'm just going to back off and hope that Hannah has a real answer for you. No, that's great. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's so many links between them. It's all mind, mind racing. But yeah, definitely um, this idea of money and waste and class are definitely all tied in together. There's very much a sense of the um, sort of the lower ranks of society have useful things to be doing. It particularly comes up in a lot of discourse about farmers' daughters, that they, they could be collecting the eggs and milking the cows and things instead of doing things like playing the piano that's and especially if they're doing it badly and it's not en actually entertaining anyone it's actually like, sort of painful for the neighbors to be dragged around to hear oh look, look what little Betty's learned to do at school and there is very much a sense of the the classes that are trying to improve themselves like sort of earn some money to sort of aggrandize their their family have got that money to spend on an education but it's it's being deemed as sort of money not well spent that it's being spent on sort of ornamental accomplishments that were traditionally the preserve of the sort of leisured upper classes who had got this the time and money to sort of lavish on these things and it's I love the description of Hannah Moore describing it as the contagion that's infecting um down the, the social stratosphere that is it's uh, an evil it's um dragging people away from doing useful things um, rather than um, something practical. So it's, it's not necessarily that you shouldn't be educated, it's that it's, it's, the, it's the practical sort of housekeeping skill that uh, there's a drive towards rather than things like art and music, which it, it's a discourse we still get. That. I think that's why the arts 
sort of get so much <laughs> um, criticism or lack of funding is this idea that it is something just for fun and at leisure time, which now more than ever we know it isn't always the case. We need um, these things for sort of mental health, or if not for arts sake and enjoyment, you do need those things, whatever um, social class you've come from, you, you should be allowed a little bit of enjoyment and leisure time and access to the arts. But that was the, the big worry is that um, I think it's the motivations. If you're motivated into trying to move out of where you belong and make this marriage, it's almost like a catfishing dialogue that you're trying to hook a rich husband and mm -hmm. move, move out of the sphere that you're born into is the big anxiety. And it's, yeah, it's the motivations behind why you were living one. Yes, it's, once it starts involving class, then it becomes threatening. Um, these yeah. are fantastic answers to my question. Thank you so much. I hope just jump in with a second. <laughs> Sorry, I can never think of a whole answer at once. Um, I was just thinking, uh, there's a few novels, and I can't remember any of their names, which make fun of, of women for creating these accomplishments, and then as soon as they get married, just dropping them. Um, you know, the harp is in the corner. It's not been touched since she got married. Um, so I think, yeah, very much you say catfishing. Um, but also, as you were talking, Hannah, I was thinking it's the same criticisms that we see for women reading as well, isn't it? It's kind of this idea, wasting time, wasting her eyesight, ruining her posture, not paying any attention to her domestic duties or the things that she should be doing. Um, and there was a great article by someone whose name I can't pronounce, but I will Google it when I stop talking, um, about um, reading and moral media panic, comparing how people talk about wastefulness of teenagers playing video games today to how people talk about the wastefulness of women reading novels in the Romantic era. Um, so I think it's, it's all connected. It's, you know, women should just be working, right? <laughs> Nothing else. Yeah. I love that. And it's really harsh, I would think. Sorry. Yeah, there's one, I always think of the Anne Radcliffe novel, I think it's in Romance of the Forest, where one of the heroines um, is meant to go and be taking a charity basket to a poor family, and she gets distracted playing on her lute or something. It's, it's music that distracts her, because she's, she's lulled into this um, sense of enjoyment, and she, it's sort of seen this bad thing, because she's, she's uh, it gets dark, and she's forgotten to go and help the local poor, and it's all, you need to be, uh, yeah concentrating on the, the things that matter and not yeah, getting lulled by music. I, I wonder if I'm completely confusing this with another novel, but I think it's in Maria Edgeworth's Belinda that there's a nant, the aunt of the protagonist is complaining that, oh yes, this cousin of yours, I spent all this money buying her an arp and lessons and she got married and she hasn't given me any money. So this was a useless investment because now I have the harp and no one is using it. And it's, yeah, that made me think of that. I've got, I, I, I just wanted, because because your presentation, Rita, was on um, music and we're, we're talking about music and its usefulness. I, I had a, like, I had a question based on me misunderstanding what you'd said, but I thought it, it, it might be interesting for you to think about anyway. <laughs> you were talking about the, the Lizzie character in Problem and Prejudice uh, playing at Darcy's house. And I, like, as you went on, I understood that she was playing music in Darcy's house. But then, but for a moment, I understood it as she was kind of like, when she was in the house, she was sort of, she was imagining her herself into the position of being like uh, you know playing at Darcy's house as in performing I, the role of of being the 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 woman of the house if you see what I mean I see but, yeah. but I wondered if like because that's obviously something that you're arguing about in the original that, that the original Pride and Prejudice accomplishes but like to what extent is playing music in the house also a sort of performance of their kind of love relationship if, if that makes sense as a question Oh, I think that's, that's, that's such an interesting question. Um, so I think, I, I, I think when, when she's performing, it's def it definitely has that link to the original novel where you get an insight into what her future is going to be like. So in the original novel, you have her thinking, uh, you know, standing, uh, standing in that high eminence, like in that image I showed, and she's looking out into the estate and she's thinking about all of the responsibility she could have, but also the good that she could that she could do with it. 
um, she sees society as a whole. So we start, uh, we start picturing her within that role of mistress of the house and with all of the, well, the money that that would involve, uh, that would involve as well. Um, and I find that really interesting in, Pro interesting in Prom and Prejudice because we kind of have that as well. You know, she's playing, uh, she's being encouraged by someone who has already achieved the success in her career that she wants. So it's very performative of, of that future um, in that sense, which, uh, which I, think, I think is really, really interesting. And in terms of their relationship, I... Um, you know, I, I read it in maybe slightly a cynical way where they, they are absolutely coming together. It's very much a love story, but it's also very much implied he's going to be a big role in providing this for her because he has the contacts that she lacks as someone who doesn't come from very prestigious uh, social circles. Um, so yeah, but the idea of performing and performing the relationship is a really interesting one that 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 I need to think about. So thank you very much for that. Hannah has. Can I actually angry. jump off the back of that? Oh, I find that sorry. Can I just jump off on that because um, I find that really interesting. The kind of idea of um, cynicism reading that plot because actually that was a lot of my reaction to your kind of description of that plot, and I was kind of thinking you were saying about your um, the kind of intention of the thinking being making it. Um, kind of making Jane Austen like the and um, kind of her work relevant to the youth of today um, and I was kind of thinking actually that novel doesn't sound to me like a novel that like the Gen Z of today would necessarily kind of accept and I was kind of thinking of that that cover with the pink and the dresses and so mm. many kind of Gen Z girls would just puke at that kind of cover so um, mm. I was just kind of yeah what what is your reaction and, and is that cynicism something that you found kind of throughout the project um and also it was kind of really interesting to listen to, to Val kind of immediately after her, after your talk and kind of thinking about the University of Wales kind of publishing board and what they would make of this novel. <laughs> Is it a good novel? Did you, did you like it or did this cynicism kind of actually pervade? Yeah, I'm just really interested in that. Yeah, so that's a very good question. I agree. The novel is the the novel. The cover is absolutely horrendous. It's uh, it's um, and I read it immediately after uh, another uh, reimagining of Austen's novels, um, which I now can't uh, can't remember the name, uh, but it was also published in two thousand and fourteen. Uh, also horrendous cover, uh, but with that one, that 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 one was really interesting in many ways. But it didn't resonate with me, and I don't think, like you said, that it would resonate with teenagers because it portrays them in this really idealized way. And the author dedicates the book to her daughters. And this for me seemed like how she wants to believe her daughters behave, but not how teenagers actually behave. So they are 16 and it mentions at some point, our parents do not allow us to use cell phones. And we accept this unquestioningly. And, and, and that means we cannot text boys. And again, we accept this. And I was like, they don't accept this. There is no way. <laughs> So that one, and then the, um, you know, and then the relationships between, uh, between teenagers, uh, maybe this is more about my uh, high school experience than anything else, but seemed too nice. Um, whereas Prom and Prejudice, you know, maybe I didn't, I didn't quite express that well enough, portrays bullying and the bullying that Lizzie receives uh, from being the scholarship student in ways that I found a lot more realistic so I think in that sense, um, it would, I think it would resonate with teenagers, this the, very much this idea that we are not over class as a concept and high school is, is so unforgiving when it comes to those, those class differences. Um, so I thought that it had that going for it. It, I, it seemed to understand better the difficulties of being a teenager today. Thank you. Fascinating. I, I want to I want to get back to sort of thinking about Val and cynicism and marketing, because I thought that was a really interesting talk. But Hannah has had her hand raised. So I, I wanted to give Hannah a chance to to to, to say why. Oh, thank you. Gabe. Just to jump in while we're on uh, Rita's uh, presentation. because it, it was so uh, I'm fascinated by this idea of Elizabeth, Elizabeth Bennett as a potential um, professional musician. Um, when in the original novel, she's quite famously had her education neglected by her mother and she plays the piano 
quite well naturally but not proficiently mm -hmm. um so I was wondering how sort of the Bennett parents are represented in terms of their um, how they're promoting their their daughter's uh, artistic education yeah, so that, that's a very good question. So the dad is a bit of a non-entity. I don't remember the dad at all. Um, the the mom, really is the best character in yeah, the exactly. original. Exactly. Um, Mrs., uh, Mrs. Bennett appears um, and actually going back to the other book, I think the other book represents Mrs. Bennett more realistically. She's this very embarrassing mother figure that always you know, arrives at the worst possible moment to, to really humiliate her daughters, just much like in the original. Whereas in this one, she's more just this very supportive, kind of cheerleading uh, maternal figure. Uh, so uh, very different from in the original. She's actually really supportive uh, of Lizzie's talent. And, um, you know, after that, uh, that excerpt the, that I shared, um, when Liz uh, stops playing, her mom just gets up and hugs and says, I'm so proud of you, which I guess is embarrassing in its own, in its own way. Um, but she's just this very supportive, lovely figure uh, who you can see is very emotionally invested in her daughter's success. So in that sense, completely different. Uh, for, yeah, I suppose it has to be, I suppose, to get her to go along that that channel of getting a scholarship and being encouraged and having those opportunities but yeah it's really interesting that they've, they've flipped that and that she's yeah. sort of someone that's really proficient and, and, and yeah and to be honest going back to, to the cynicism I feel like in that scene her mum is mostly there just so that she's not just going by herself to Darcy's house I think she's very much there in this kind of chaperone figure not really doing much besides just being very supportive there <laughs> Thank you. So on uh, back back to cynicism and and back to 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 Val because oh uh, the uh, a couple of things the first thing I should say is that Crystal says looking on uh, the ESTC there are there there is a physical copy in the British Library so uh, of the uh, of the Foresters oh, um, so that might be worth to know it. thank you um, <laughs> that's useful to know <laughs> and then but I was really interested in like the kind of the the parallelism between. Elizabeth Gunning's cynicism and then mm. your own cynicism in, in terms of how 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 they how how she and you both marketed their their work and I thought that was yeah, that was a really yeah. interesting I just I was full of admiration really for the way that she did it and I kind of pinched the idea I think I mean she was so clever with the marketing of her books because she was kind of this sort of you know minor figure I suppose writing these books just to make a living um because she didn't have any family support anymore um and the, the way she just um she, I mean she she used her books to continue to market her other books so in uh, in one of the first ones, um, uh, there's the packet, and then there is Lord Fitzhenry. And in the packet, she says, and then Lord Fitzhenry came along. And, and But if you want to know what happens then, you have to buy the next book. <laughs> it's just really clever. It's the way that she does it and the way that she's used and the way that she inserts a scandal into it. But the scandal is the most interesting thing about her, really, which is why I used it. So... <laughs> Fantastic. Well, good. I mean, it's so exciting that it's been okayed by the editorial board. So we we look know, forward yeah. to the, the the publication of the novel and yes, your continuing no. marketing strategies for for getting people to buy it. Yeah, I might try something similar with the 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 packet and the Lord Fitzhenry as the follow up novels. But I thought, well, I'll just see if this one crashes and burns first. <laughs> so if I just sell, you know, sort of three copies of it or something. <laughs> so. Yeah, if you want to encourage people to to get it. I think it's mm. exciting. It is a good book. Fantastic. <laughs> Um, brilliant. So, um, Ro Rosie, you 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 waited so patiently to sort of to 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 speak last, and and people and 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 are waiting for for a question. I really loved the um, the the letter and um, the, the 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 silliness of it, and I wondered sort of like when you were reading the second part in particular, I was wondering about the sort of the Keats use of lists and how the, that listing becomes kind of like a humor, it, it sort of, it gets a sort of cumulatively humorous effect. And I always forget what, um, I'm on record as forgetting this on my, in the first table talk, but there's one, there's a scene, there's a letter where he writes about his Scottish tour and he talks about all the ways he's gonna kind of mimic Anne Radcliffe. And he, 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 he it has a sort of similar list effect, I think. And I just thought, I, I wondered about, like what are the what are the forms of Keats's humor in his in in his letter writing? If that makes sense as a question, uh, yeah, it does. Um, 
he, yeah, he he does this thing uh, quite a lot where he'll say like um, small, smaller, smallest, and have like lists that sort of work in that order and uh, describes people or like um, structures jokes in that in that way. Um, and yeah, the the one with the the Anne Radcliffe stuff, I can't remember the quotes now, but he talks about waterfalls and um, yeah. being as gothic as possible and uh, that kind of thing. Um, uh, I think, I mean, yeah, he does a lot of, I suppose, like political literary satire kind of stuff. And I suppose, yeah, particularly on the walking tour, because he's so disappointed to find Wordsworth uh, out canvassing for the Lowthers and, you know, sort of showing off his, um, what Keats, I think, believed were his sort of uh, very right wing, uh, political leanings and that kind of thing um so i think because of those disappointments uh, he makes those kinds of jokes and it's usually quite satirical and cutting but also in in the letters you get quite a lot of his bawdy humor that's very kind of like laddie um which i think a lot of people oh, cat just launched uh down the <laughs> stairs um uh that i think people are often surprised to find in keats because i think we think of him as like sensitive and fragile and tragic and that kind of thing but the letters show this very kind of irreverent bawdiness um so i think that yeah there's lots of lots of strings to his bow in terms of how he is humorous in his letters fantastic so i, I, I have that's... to confess just kind of again just um kind of working on the I, I i've never actually um read or been immersed in any of keats letters and it that was so fascinating it was so so interesting because it, it's su such a different persona from what um i think so many kind of build into their consciousness of keats as a as a writer and uh um you're right the, the kind of tr traditional image is this kind of really sensitive um and often quite um tragic kind of character full of pathos and uh, it was just so refreshing to see that letter i was it was a real treat so thank you so much i just wanted to articulate that um i guess sometimes when you work so much in your own research it's, it's often kind of it, it's you, you kind of forget like what what people's reactions are when they experience it for the first time I just wanted to share that sense of delight with you it was I it was so so pleasing thank you <laughs> oh thank you yeah um they are worth a read because they kind of read there's only two volumes of them and they're not particularly long compared to like Shelley's letters or Byron's letters when there's volumes volumes um and I think the beauty of them is that they are they're really funny um, but they are really tragic for obvious reasons, like, you know, his early death and his brother's death, and that's all in those letters. So it is amazing how he marries humour and, like, often really, like, yeah, bawdy, laddie humour with, like, tragedy and sorrow, like, in the next sentence, and how he does that, and I think how he uses that as a coping mechanism is really interesting. And he's just so aware of what he can do with the letter form in particular in order to, like, counteract grief or that kind of thing so they are they're well worth a read if you have time <laughs> you yeah, i mean you're talking about the like his silly letters or his silliest letter reminded me if you didn't if you didn't attend the bars digital events a couple of weeks ago which was on zany romanticism they they had a whole uh the first the first paper um after a sort of brief introduction to zaniness was about zany keeps mm. and, and and i think that like t tim if you if you if you go if you listen into that you get and you get another sense of sort of keeps his sort of comic sense uh, through through that so I, I, me... i've been I've, i i i increasingly think we need to sort of think about keats rita note to self in our in our ridiculous project because he sort of pops up in the in in a lot of places in uh, over the course of this uh, over the course of this work he, he he keeps on popping up so matt ward's melodious chuckle paper that he did he came and did for for us at edge hill um, was was about kind of dark laughter as well as as well as light laughter. So laughter at, at, at darkness and tragedy and and sadness and melancholy, as well as laughter that was more zany, I suppose. And it's an, I think it's a nice way to sort of think about. Um, it's a nice a nice way to sort of deepen our appreciation of Keats by seeing. It yeah, absolutely. Book, it makes me wish he he tried like an angry novel <laughs> that would be amazing um, but oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you so the, much. the lost the, the lost the lost works of the sort of romantics who sort of die in early early death we don't get the i i can imagine keats writing a great picaresque sort of thing like smollett <laughs> or someone 
um, around sort of Scotland and and in, in to, through to Italy, I suppose. Um, I had a question because uh, we're we're running close to our the, the the end of things, but I had a question kind of for the panel um, because I thought sort of even like the 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 central I think the central three, so Hannah's, Anna's, and Tim's sort of all grappled with this idea of education and what education meant and sort of like pro like progressive models of, of education as well as kind of regressive regressive ones um and I, I I think it's a way to I think we can sort of stretch it to the whole panel by by thinking about you you, you know the, the 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 editing process and the 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 write, writing letters and kind of young adult fiction as as sort of having an educative uh possibility or at least a, a, a model of education that incorporates play like I think the the, the more sophisticated models of education that, that that some of the middle papers were grappling with seem to get be getting towards so it's kind of like it's kind of like I, I guess it's, it's an open question in that sort of anyone anyone tell me tell me about play and playfulness and education in your in your chosen sort of extract anyone can jump in or like I've, I've, I've like silenced everyone with my crazy questioning. I think mine is sort of playful, more playful the more you look into it. I think we sort of on first view, it seems very harsh, very, especially at the figure of Miss, Miss Mushroom, you feel sorry for her that how she's being sort of lambasted for things that aren't her fault and and even then she's trying to learn things she's failing and being judged on on all sides and but then I think when I came back to it um sort of after my original reading for my thesis coming back for it for today I think you can find lots more playfulness in it and they're sort of tying themselves in knots about who they're criticizing and 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 why so even though it's quite a conservative um publication that uh, they did sort of they wouldn't be sort of promoting a liberal view of education or anything like that. They sort of tie themselves in knots by criticising this vulgar family, saying that they're ill-bred and that they, they wouldn't be able to learn anything to, to change that. But then um, the figure of the niece, who's very shadowy within there, it sort of reminds me of the Featheringtons in Bridgerton, that you've got this, this niece that's actually being ushered away, but is attra actually attracting a lot more attention because she's sort of a naturally um, sort of beautiful and effervescent and charming and clever person that they're trying to sort of shove in the broom cupboard as a, <laughs> don't look at her, look at the daughters. Um, and the discussion around her is really interesting and in that's how um, she has this sort of natural talent that can that the mother's failed to, to teach her she made an excuse against that she's oh I can't teach her anything because it, it would never stick because she's ill-bred um and it's it's actually it's, it's criticizing this family as being bad teachers so can we actually believe that um so it's it's questioning all these sides of, of nature nurture what what can be achieved and I think it's raising a lot of questions. You know, it sort of doesn't answer the questions and it does criticise people on all sides, but it is raising those debates. And that's what I really enjoyed sort of hearing Anna and, and Tim's sort of later takes where people are actually coming up with theories on how to, to, to deal with it. And these really progressive, great ideas coming coming through from Ferrier and the, the Taylors. Fab. Does Anna or Tim want to talk about, yeah, talk about sort of their, their, their progressive models of education or the progressive models of education that they found? Um, I think uh, I could be in danger of overselling Ferrier's progressiveness in education because she, sorry, Alicia Douglas, the person who educates Mary, she does keep on coming back to the idea of religion and saying, actually, it's got to be all be about religion and, and being useful and being good, which you know, I think in the, I only had five minutes today and I almost made it sound as if Ferrier was kind of like right here in 2021 on how we should educate people. And she's not exactly. And I think there's a lot more fun for us as readers than perhaps there would have been for the characters. So I think even the good education in marriage is, in the novel marriage, is or would have been quite serious um, and, and practical. But it's hilarious for us the readers um, and just like Mrs Mushroom the three maiden aunts think that they're experts 
but we can see that they're not. So you think just not having them there would make it better. Um, but yeah, and also the, the, the piece that I spoke about today is from a wider project that looks at how Ferrier and Austin does this as well. So I was really excited to hear um, the paper on Austin, on Austin's birthday, um, because I think she does very, very similar things. It's sort of kind of being overtaught or being crammed full with knowledge is actually the worst thing you can do. But she's she's not quite, you know, she's not quite embodying the theories we have in 2021. She's just kind of anticipating just a little bit and making it really fun for us as opposed to fun for her characters. I mean, um, what I really liked in Tim's paper was that that idea that sort of that the, the, the religious emphasis of the tailors could be progressive and they were using it to be to sort of stress kind of egalitarianism and kind of like uh, I think you said sort of gender neutral sort of a, a model of education. It was a really like, yeah, really fascinating um, sort of family that I need to find out more about, I think. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, it's I'll, I I could go on for hours about this, <laughs> so I I will try and restrain myself. Um, just two quick things was that um, um, firstly, um, so so this paper is kind of a I've taken some of the notes from this from a paper that I'm writing at the moment, which which literally compares um the evangelicalism of Hannah Moore um and compares it to the Taylors, and it, um my kind of conclusion is that they they both use um specifically different kind of versions of evangelical theology um to um in in the taylor's case absolutely like they they are they are kind of with us um kind of advocating for teenage rights hannah moore is so much more complicated but she does do the same um thing her concern is that um a new kind of um wave of um revolutionary mania is kind of sweeping um the country and and she wants teenagers to be um stronger and more robust and resilient in their kind of um pulling down of this wave so she um, on the one hand wants them to kind of maintain a modesty and a kind of um, a kind of self-awareness but on the other hand she's she really encourages them to stand up and fight for their beliefs um, so kind of that's the way I'm kind of looking at evangelical theology and the, um, so that's really interesting and I'll, I'll kind of let you know when that paper comes out <laughs> yeah. um, and the other thing I want to say is just another brief shout out to the tailors and um, they are so playful they are really really playful they're um, their conduct books always amaze me um, how um, progressive and forward thinking they are um, and that's why they did so well um, in particular the um, sorry in particular they um, they're being sold um, in the 1810s mainly but um, the, the likes of Fordyce and James Gregory and all these kind of um, traditional conduct writers that we associate with the conduct genre um, they were still popular they were kind of having all these reprints and new editions that were coming out in the 1810s so they're selling directly alongside the tailors literally on the same bookshelves um, and the tailors just poke so much fun at them and they say if you ask a teenager they'll tell you more about the conduct of 50 years ago than than four dice can and it, it, it's just brilliant um, so um, if you want playfulness in conduct literature do do check out the tailors um, and I'll, I'll shut up there but um, I can go on for hours. <laughs> Molly, Molly has a, a, a thing about, uh, wants to ask a question about Adelaide O'Keefe, but does know, but also notes that we've run out of time. And I think we should, we, we'll, we'll bring this evening to the close, but that you, it might be something that you want to um, chase up with, um, uh, with with Molly. But, and she sort of talks about talking in the future. And I think um, uh, Anna, Anna uh, proclaims a secret shameful admiration for Anna Moore and wants to know when um, that that paper comes out, and I think we'd all like to we, we'd all like to hear uh, about it a bit more, Tim. That's fantastic. Thank you all for such wonderful papers. It was I think it was a really rich and exciting evening, and thank you all, sort of almost more so, to our devoted attendees, all all, all six of you who've stayed to the end. Um, thank you so much for um, for attending. I think you know it, it, it was it was a really wonderful, rich um, event tell your friends and, and send them the, the recording when it's uh, uh, available. Um, it was really um, uh, wonderful to have you all. Um, thank you so much about it. I will be in touch about um, claiming payment. On that note, I will bid you all um, farewell and good night. Take care, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Okay,